So here's the Fed's dilemma, and it, it's playing out in real time. So Jay Powell gave, I lost count, of seven or eight speeches, and they said the same thing every time. He said, inflation is job one. We're on a path to raise interest rates. We're not going to quit until inflation is under control. Now, there's a little wiggle room around that. Their target is two. They actually look at personal consumption expenditure year over year, core. That's their metric. There are 15 ways to measure inflation, but that's the one they like. But even that is still over close to five. It's a long way from two. That's the point. You're trying to get to two. They're a long way from two. But there's something called the terminal rate. What's the terminal rate? Well, no one knows the number. I don't know because Jay Powell doesn't know. So we're all estimating. But um, the terminal rate, it's a rate that's high enough to bring down inflation on its own without further rate hikes. In other words, we can stop here and confident that inflation is going to come down without doing more. Because the conundrum is, okay, they've been raising rates since March 2022. Monetary policy works with a lag. Inflation peaked in July 2022, and it has been coming down ever since. You know, some of the some months were, you know, January was hot compared to December, but the trend has been down. So they're raising rates and inflation is coming down. So that's good. But here's what they don't know. Was inflation coming down because they were raising rates or had they already hit the terminal rate and they just didn't know it because wall street was like no you've hit the terminal rate stop please stop you got this under control the fed doesn't believe that one of the greatest blunders in monetary policy was paul volcker in 1980 who had started raising rates in 1979 and inflation was coming down but then in 1980 we had a very sharp recession that had nothing to do with monetary policy it wasn't caused by paul volcker jimmy carter put a cap on credit card interest and everyone banks stopped issuing credit cards. So, well, that'll that'll sink the economy. And then so Volcker reacted to that by lowering interest rates seven percentage points, not 70 basis points, seven percentage points, because we're in a recession, right? That's what Feds do, the Fed chairs do. But because it was a regulatory blunder, they fixed it and the economy came roaring back. And then inflation really took off, worse than when Volcker got in in 79, early 1980. So Volcker had to take rates to 20% to get inflation under control the second time after cutting them in 1980. And that's called the Volcker mistake or the Volcker blunder. And Volcker himself, I spoke to him, he said, yeah, that was that was a mistake that I should have stuck. I should have stuck to my program, not worried about the economy and unemployment, but just got inflation under control. But when he threw in the towel prematurely, the inflation went to the moon. Jay Powell doesn't want to be that guy. Jay Powell knows that episode as well as I do. And he doesn't want to be the guy who throws in the towel early and then inflation just goes to the moon and then he's got it. Then he has to take interest rates to 15 percent or something ridiculous. So Wall Street's saying you're already there. Mission accomplished. Powell's saying not so fast. They told Volcker that and he cut rates and it was an enormous mistake. So Powell's not going to be that guy. So what is the terminal rate today? I would say five and a half because we had we had a lot of hot data, you know, unemployment down, uh, job creation up, retail sales up, not to the moon, but these are the opposite of what Powell is looking for. So he's had no confirmation that inflation is coming down on his own. He's had a lot of data that says inflation may be getting ready to take off again. So you got to say the terminal rate went from five and a quarter to five and a half, maybe more. And Powell always said, I don't care if there's a recession. I don't care if there's unemployment because the long-term costs of inflation are going to be much greater than those short-term problems. We got to suffer through that to get a bigger problem under control. He thinks of inflation. He said this many, many times. Now, along comes Silicon Valley Bank. Okay. Oh, by the way, in addition to raising rates, don't forget QT, quantitative tightening. They were shrinking their balance sheet. It's very hard to estimate the monetary impact of shrinking the balance sheet, but the best estimate is for every trillion dollars you take it down, it's probably equal to a one percentage point hike in the Fed funds rate. So the tightening has been more than just taking the Fed funds rate up. You also have to take into account QT. Now let's go back to the, the bond, the bond guarantee and bailing out the entire banking system. The Fed proceeded to guarantee every deposit and every bank in the entire U.S. banking system. We were talking, you know, six or seven trillion dollars of assets. And the way they did it was um, a lot of other banks, you know, big ones and small ones, at least the big ones that had good risk management, but a lot of small and medium-sized banks, they had the same problem Silicon Valley Bank had. Maybe the depositors weren't work, walking out the door, or maybe they weren't funding tech startups, but they had underwater bonds and overnight deposits and were facing the same thing. So the Fed said, Okay, all you banks, if you send us your bonds, we'll give you cash. Okay, that's just a normal discount operation. But they will give you cash equivalent to the par value. 
So again, remember the market value is like 80 cents on the dollar, but the Fed says, we'll give you 100 cents on the dollar. So now you, you ship your bonds to the Fed, they give you not 100%, which is like low collateral, or, but they give you 120%. So the banks are shipping in bonds that are worth 80 cents on the dollar. Why wouldn't you do that? I'm like, hey, hey, Fed, if you want to give me a low, low interest rate bridge loan uh, with 80% down, I'll take all you got. So now the banks are going to are going to do that. And by the way, there's no, because it's structured kind of like a repurchase agreement, there's no sale. So they don't have to market to market. If you sold it to a third party, a dealer, you would, you'd have to take the loss. But now they don't have to take the loss. So they're shipping in billions, potentially a trillion dollars or more of these bonds. They're not getting 80, 90 cents on the dollar, which is what they're worth. They're getting 100 cents on the dollar, which was the original purchase price. They don't have to take the loss and they're getting cash. Why wouldn't you do that all day long? So in effect, they bailed out the entire banking system to the tune of trillions of dollars. They've just blew up the $250,000 limit. Forget that, I mean, I know what the statute says, but they threw that out the window. And uh, the, the moral hazard, the economic consequences, the repercussions of this are kind of unimaginable. I mean, I can sketch them, I can talk about them. You know, to hear Jenny I'll say it's not a bailout. Are you kidding me? This is the biggest bailout in history. And I, you know, I, I negotiated the LTCM bailout. I, I lived through that. That was a trillion dollars of derivatives. Um, through 2008, 2020, the pandemic, I go back to 1994, the Mexican tequila crisis. I've, I've lived through all of these and been more or less directly involved in all of them. And this is orders of magnitude greater in terms of what's being bailed out. Doesn't that mean that a lot of banks will be sending the bonds to the Fed and getting cash? Yes, yeah, exactly what it means. Well, where's the cash come from? You got to print it. So on the one hand, we're doing quantitative tightening by letting bonds mature and not reinvesting. But on the other hand, you just send an open invitation, open party, house party to every bank in the country saying, send us your bonds and we'll give you cash. Not only that, but hundred cents on the dollar, even if they're worth 80. So, so you're going to have potentially trillions of dollars of new money being printed at a time when the Fed's trying to get inflation under control and they were trying to shrink the balance sheet, they're going to be expanding the balance sheet. So, I mean, there's no way out. There's no good way out of this. You can pause. Uh, I don't think they will, but you could pause and not raise rates, right? And implicitly saying we're not going to raise rates for the foreseeable future because we got all these losses in the banks. Okay, inflation goes to the moon. I promise you it'll just take off like a rocket. Or you can raise interest rates 25 basis points and we'll continue this war on inflation, but you're just going to increase the bond losses in the banks and make them send you more bonds and get more cash. Or the third thing is just take away the, the umbrella and let all these banks fail. I mean, it's like name your poison, name your poison. You can have runaway inflation, severe acute banking crisis, or basically a lot more, as I say, a lot more bank failures uh, and, and a severe recession because you're going to keep raising rates. There are three choices, but none of them are